Welcome to the program after the break. Now the telephone lines would be open shortly uh, to welcome your calls, to, uh, to pass your comments or ask any questions pertaining to today's topic, uh, which is uh, Nawaz in New York, an idiot abroad. So a uh, strange thing happened this time when he was coming, uh, he, uh, from, from, he was traveling from Islamabad to New York. In most cases, whenever he, uh, he is traveling to New York, he makes a, a brief sojourn at uh, uh, London, and that stopover was being expected yesterday, but this time Nawashtif took a, a, a direct flight and uh, he flew fast, actually. Uh, there wasn't any Concorde, but maybe his uh, aeroplane was uh, flying at the speed of uh, the Concorde. Uh, he did not stop at London, but uh, Amam Hundipson showed that when he comes back from New York, he will definitely make a stopover in London, maybe for two to three days. Uh, to look after his business empire, which is uh, in excess of three billion pounds in the UK, and 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 that can be certified. I say that with the full uh, authority of my my research and uh, evidence. So anyway, um, okay. coming towards uh, Nawaz in New York as uh, an idiot abroad, uh, there are several questions. You now he might be taking down his notes today and tomorrow before he appears on the podium of UN General Assembly on Wednesday evening to make his uh, prime ministerial speech. Uh, he must be taking so many notes from so many people. So maybe uh, he would be thinking like, where is Irfan Siddiqui? So he, he'll be using the script uh, provided by Irfan Siddiqui from the Foreign Office. The question is that how much prepared uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif is to make his speech and put his uh, nation's point of view across to the international leadership. Uh, has he got enough briefing from the Foreign Office? Has he got enough material provided by the Prime Minister Secretariat? Has he got enough input from uh, the Parliamentary Committee on Kashmir and uh, Foreign Office or Foreign Policy? Has he got enough input from uh, uh, the AJK president, who in my view is the only person, is of some substance. A few days ago, he visited Azad Kashmir and took some notes from Masood Khan. Masood Khan is uh, an accomplished diplomat and uh, he is the right person uh, in Azad Kashmir as the president. Uh, quite legitimately, he has uh, won that status. And his input would be the most valuable. His input would be much more valuable to Nawaz Sharif than Maliha Lodi, highly overrated and overstated uh, uh, quasi-diplomat or quasi-intellectual. Masood Khan's input would be much more superior than those of Irfan Siddiqui or like Jalil Abbas Jilani even. So he really matters a lot. So I'm sure this time me and Nawaz Sharif will have much more powerful narrative to put across to the UN General Assembly podium. Now, other question is that will Nawaz Sharif get enough time to finish his speech, finish his script on time, the time stipulated, provided to him, allocated to him to finish his speech. I'm sure he will do about 15, 20 uh, different rehearsals in front of the mirror and he would be able to manage his, uh, his speech within the time uh, allocated to him. The next question is that what level of or what type of lobbying, uh, regional, far regional or international, Nawaz Sharif has done in the last three months to make sure that whatever he says at the UN General Assembly is listened to and accepted by the people who really matter, people in the UN, people at the State Department, people at the National Security Agency in the United States, people at the Pentagon, people at the European Union. So we have to see that what sort of lobbying has he done and what he intends to do after he finishes his speech on Wednesday. Next is, does he have a political will? This is the most important point that I would like to put across is, does he have political will to present and plead the case of Kashmir at the UN General Assembly? 
Has he got enough clout, political clout or diplomatic clout, his political will to impress the EU foreign policy chief Federica Mogherini or the UN uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon or Secretary of State, US Secretary of State John Kerry or the US uh, Defense Secretary Ash Carter, US President Barack Obama, British Prime Minister Theresa May and important people, people from Saudi Arabia, Saudi uh, Foreign Minister, Saudi uh, Air Apparent. So, whether or not he has that strong political will to impress upon these people so that they support and if at some point in the UN Security Council it comes to voting then he would be able to garner enough support to get a resolution adopted by the Security Council lambasting India, pillaring India and criticizing India for carrying out brutalities in Indian Hell Kashmir. This is a very big question. The next point is that how, how Mia Nawaz Sharif interacts and interfaces with the, the Afghan President Ashraf Ghani, the Indian Foreign Ministers Sushma Swaraj, her Foreign Secretary Subramaniam Jayashankar and about seven people flanking them at the UN General Assembly Hall and later on, if possible, at the UN Security Council Hall. And how Team Nawaz Sharif conducts itself when they interact with other key countries where Pakistan's point of view is accepted and acknowledged and accordingly a supportive, a generative environment is created where Pakistan has a win-win situation. Now, this I'm, I have covered how Nawaz Sharif and his entourage, how prepared they are and how they would be conducting themselves, representing 200 million people of Pakistan. Now, from the Indian side, let's see how they would be conducting. We have come to know through media reports that the Indian Prime Minister is not coming to the UN General Assembly for many reasons. Indian Deputy Prime Minister, who is also the Interior or Home Minister Rajnath, he's equally important as Narendra Modi is. So he's also not coming. So Indian delegation is being led by Sushma, uh, Sushma Saraj and her Foreign Secretary Subramaniam Jaishankar. Now how prepared they are, yes, they have done their homework. I would give them full marks the way they concocted they fabricated and they engineered a, a bomb explosion and the firing incident and the attack on the Uri uh, Brigade headquarters a day before yesterday where uh, one and a half dozens of Indian troops, they were, uh, they, they perished needlessly. So again, like I said at the start of my program that uh, the Northern Command, Commander Lieutenant General D.S. Huda, he did enough homework and at that juncture when Pakistan was coming to United Nations to expose Indian atrocities, Indian bellicosity in Indian Hal Kashmir, uh, they engineered that bomb blast. And it was covered, it was amply covered by the Indian media and pro-Indian global media, which is, which is in plenty in New York, which is in plenty in London and elsewhere. So Indians, they did their homework and with that, uh, the statements, the very aggressive statements by the, the Indian Raksha Mantri Manohar Parikar that Pakistan is behind that. Now the question comes to mind is that how Nawaz Sharif would comfortably be able to lambast Narendra Modi and his administration at the UN General Assembly. When Narendra Modi, each time he wakes up from a nightmare and he gives his statement that Pakistan is a rogue state, Pakistan is engaged in terrorism, Pakistan should stop terrorism, and the similar, and the similar statements of that ilk, so that they are being uh, 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 percolated from the Indian side, and 
not a common person is doing, not an ordinary leader is doing that, but Prime Minister Narendra Modi is doing that. And on the contrary, our Prime Minister, he spares no opportunity. He does not miss any opportunity. He leaves no stone unturned towards inviting Narendra Modi to Pakistan along with hundreds of mysterious arcane entourage to attend his granddaughter's wedding. So what a wonderful relationship is that. Is that, is that unilateral concession? Is that part of uh, confidence building measures? Is that conceding? Is that conceding by the Pakistani Prime Minister? That okay, the Indian Prime Minister, he keeps on lambasting Pakistan, keeps on uh, criticizing and condemning Pakistan on all available forums that Pakistan is a rogue state. Pakistan is a terrorist state. Pakistan sponsors and facilitates global terrorism. That is being done by the Indian Prime Minister and our beloved Prime Minister who is so great, who is so humble, who has such a high degree of humility that he responds just like uh, uh, the old Christian doctrine if somebody slaps in your face, turn the other cheek towards. So our Prime Minister, is he doing that by design? Is he behaving extra humble or what is going on? That's a big question that why he invites such a person to his family functions. With that, we have a question. Uh, we have a caller to ask a question. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Ji, wa alaikum salam. Brother, I was watching your program. Your name, please, brother. My name is Shiraz. Shiraz. I was watching, I was just flicking the channel and I came to uh, by you and uh, it was quite interesting what you are discussing in Park India relations and the Nawaz Sharif uh, is in New York. Uh, first question is, from here as you displayed uh, an idiot abroad, who is an idiot in this uh, topic? First of all, a uh, second thing, uh, my question is that, uh, I mean, what is the way forward uh, to improve uh, India, Park relationships, and then uh, if they improve the in relations between India and Pakistan, where um, where is the international community as we witnessing since uh, July uh, but this year? Uh, continuously, uh, Indian forces are killing uh, uh, Kashmiris. Uh, more than 100 people been killed. Uh, around uh, 200 to 300. Uh, people confirmed they lost their eyesight because of tear gas and so on. 7,000 people are confirmed injured. Uh, today is the maybe 70th day since the, uh, the curfew is in, imposed. So uh, who is going to, uh, don't you think there is a um, uh, room for uh, international community to intervene in this issue and they should uh, basically India Pakistan bilaterally they will never resolve their problems or issue, uh, but there is a room for a, a international community to jump in. And what is the what is the way forward for this situation at the moment? Thank you very much, Brother Shiraz. Thanks for calling. Now, when he was referring to when uh, I I mentioned that amply in my introduction that an idiot abroad is not we are we are not calling the prime minister he is a respectable man we respect him after all he's representing our country pakistan so an idiot abroad i was trivializing uh, a sky television sitcom that ran from september 2010 to december 2012 that became a very very a uh, box office hit on the broadway it was the the hittest of the of the series in in the recent uh, television production so i was just uh, comparing that but uh, i wasn't calling uh, uh, nawaz sharif as an idiot i was just referring to that sitcom now second how to deal with india bilateral approach is not going to work i'm telling you uh, i've got an expertise I, I have a research doctoral research on india pakistan relation through confidence security building measures and it has to be a multilateral or or, or international approach and UN resolutions passed in 1950s, 60s and 70s, they will have to be reactivated and the solution to Kashmir issue is only and only that lies in those resolutions. Uh, we have got another caller. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Wa alaikum salam. Your name please? Uh, Mrs. Tai from Bradford. Mrs. Tai, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, you got very, very interesting topic uh, and uh, 
what these uh, rulers have for us, especially Nawaz Sharif, uh, the only thing we see is their luxuries, their style, uh, their mansions, their, their, the buying properties in the most uh, uh, expensive uh, areas in, in the world. And uh, 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 their VIP movements, uh, that's, that is their policy for this country. And uh, uh, no, uh, is Metro... Uh, the okay, okay, thank you. Th thank you, Mrs. Mrs. Thayer. I've got, I've got your point. I've got your point. Let's not digress. We should stay on the topic, and I'll get back to you later. Thank you very much for your question. I've understood your, your point of view. That's more like a comment. Now, uh, very quickly, now, what Nawaz must do today and tomorrow? Number one, he should try to meet people like Secretary of State John Kerry, even if that is for five minutes on the sidelines. He must meet with the National Security uh, Agency, National Security Advisor of the uh, United States, Susan Rice. He should try to grab an opportunity to meet with the, uh, the UN Security Agency like NSA. There are so many people are around in the corridors of the UN General Assembly and the UN Main Building. And the people like Admiral Michael Rogers or his representatives attending uh, that session. Nawashti must grab an opportunity to meet with Ash Carter, the, the U.S. Defense Secretary, and James Comey. So he's a representative from the, uh, the FBI. They would also be there. So he should try to meet, or his delegates, they, they should try to meet with them. Next is, Nawaz Shetif must have a meaningful dialogue before his speech with uh, the Saudi heir apparent Mohammed bin Naif and the Saudi Defense Minister come Deputy Heir Apparent Mohammed bin Salman and the Saudi Foreign Minister Adil al Jubair. Along the same lines, with the same gusto and same determination, Nawaz Sharif at equal footing should meet with the Iranian uh, Ambassador Jawad Zarif and Iranian President Hassan Rouhani. So before making his speech, he should take them into confidence, though that uh, meeting is of two to five minutes. Then Nawashti must meet with uh, Dr. Uh, Zaid al-Rad, the High Commissioner, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And again, a brief meeting will do. And then he should try to meet as many members from the Arab League, as many members from the OIC, the foreign ministers, defense minister, their, their diplomats, and he must meet with them. And he should organize a dinner or luncheon for these about 100 people, whosoever can attend. And there, as a second phase, he should give a, give a speech after his Wednesday speech to these people. And this homework must have been done by Milia Lodi and by Jalil Abbas Jilani and other, other people who are having, who are drawing hefty pay and perks from the Pakistani state exchequer funds provided by the taxpayers of Pakistan. So if they haven't done that homework, if they haven't uh, organized uh, that sort of dinner or luncheon after Prime Minister's speech, then they haven't done there. So that gastronomic diplomacy, it does play the trick sometimes. Uh, so these people he must but. This we are talking of hardcore diplomacy. This we are talking about uh, a legitimate political force representing Pakistan. This may expect from, uh, from, uh, from a prime minister who was elected through fair and free elections, a prime minister who does not carry out or demonstrate the, the conflict of interest in Pakistan, who does not have allegation against his, his probity, his dignity, integrity, then that sort of person, that sort of leader from Pakistan can put across and meet with these people and only, and only keeping in view his point of view and his objective that he has to garner enough support in, in, in his speech uh, to adopt a resolution at the UN Security Council. But the most important is, is, the, is the side program. The side program is the most important program. And our beloved Prime Minister would be more interested in the side programs. There are reports, but not authenticated or confirmed yet, 
that Hussein Haqqani, he's trying, he's biting all his nails to contact all the people who are closer to me and Nawaz Sharif to arrange his one hour, half an hour meeting with Nawaz Sharif so that he can offer his services. And he is, and the services he can render is the army bashing in Pakistan. He has done enough in Bangladesh and getting those uh, 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 aged, those aging 70, 80 years old Jamaat Islami activists who were alleged and who were tried and sentenced for their uh, uh, very distant role or oblique role in the 1971 atrocities in Dhaka. So Hussein Akani pleaded their case and all these people, they were hanged by uh, the, the maverick prime minister of Bangladesh, Hasina uh, Wajid. So next is the side program is very, very important because Nawashti would be having four to five important me meetings of Park U.S. Trade Relation Group Business Forum headed by the people like Sheikh Saeed and he has already uh, given a good report to the Prime Minister that he would be putting before him the representatives from the five leading gold mining giants like uh, uh, the Gold Corp who are extracting gold in excess of two trillion dollars per year. Then is uh, uh, Barrick Gold, another Canadian firm. Gold Corp is a Canadian firm. Barrick Gold, also a Canadian firm. And another one is SNC Level, and that has got uh, a case and dispute against the government of Pakistan and it's in the International Arbitration Court. So that's going on. So uh, uh, these people would be meeting. The people from uh, Antaf Yasta, the Chilean gold mining firm, they would be meeting with the Prime Minister. The people from uh, Newmont, uh, the, the US gold gold mining giant, their representatives would be meeting with me and Vashtif. And the people from uh, Newcrest, the Australian gold mining uh, firm, the people from South African gold firm, Anglo Gold Ashanti. So their representatives, as many as 13 people would be meeting with our prime minister to get exclusive rights to dig out gold from Rakodik, uh, a Pakistan's gold mine in Balochistan, where a confirmed extractable three trillion dollar worth of gold can easily be extracted from Rakodik. So maybe Mian Washtif uh, this time will strike a deal. His sons will be flying. At this time, they will avoid the media coverage. They will remain behind the curtains. But these gold mining giants will definitely be meeting our prime minister. And if prime minister is able to raise $10 billion as upfront money going towards uh, not Pakistan, but the Sharif family empire, that would be a great achievement by the Prime Minister. But all these things will be done in an arcane manner, in a very mysterious manner. And this time, all measures have been adopted to make sure that the, the Pakistani media does not cover these events. So this is all, with all that, how Nawaz Sharif is going to conduct himself and create that awareness amongst the various people he must meet with the Iranian delegation to sort out the energy crisis. And, but let's see, the Pakistani ambassador to Tehran, Mr. J Mr. Jadmani, has done enough work, homework, instead of uh, having his almost every day his dinner at the Indian restaurant in Tehran called Taj Mahal restaurant over there. So we have high hopes, but we have to be pragmatic in attaching our optimism with Nawaz Sharif, whatever he can gain. Nawaz Sharif is a person who is a very brave man. He's, he's audacious. He's brave. He's very bold. He will put across Pakistan's point of view. Now, he is a person who knows no fear. He is a person who knows no danger. He is a person who knows nothing. So what we can expect from Nawaz Sharif, let's hope and let's Hope, wait and see on Wednesday how he conducts himself at the podium at the UN General Assembly. Till then, goodbye.